Welcome to the Phil Hay Q&A then on the Phil Hay Show. Phil, we've got a bunch of questions sent in to you uh, by fans. Listen, have you got fans? Listeners? No. no. Marvellous though. <laughs> Marvellous. Looking forward to this. Right. We will not hesitate. We'll get straight into it then. And we will start off with a question from Connor. So in honour of October and upcoming Halloween, I wanted to know who is the scariest figure connected with Leeds United that Phil has ever encountered? And... Which Leeds United horror story still gives him nightmares? Dennis Wise, in answer to the first question, uh, who would definitely not need a costume. And if he turned up to your house, wouldn't even need to say trick or treat. You'd just give him the bowl and say, look, have it all. Have it all. Leave me in peace, please. What, what, um, made, him, what made him scary, though? Because he's, he's only a, a wee fella. Just volatile, really. And you knew he could go off at, at any minute. You know, he, he, he didn't always tend to be too rational about things. Um, if there were... I always say this, but if there was going to be one manager who was going to off you, off you out in the car park, it was probably probably going to be going to be Dennis. I did an amazing interview with him once. Actually, the only time I ever sat down with Wise, it was it was properly fascinating to find out a little bit about what was um, in his head. But I think that was in the top two three month period where we actually got on, and it never happened again. And Gus Poyet left that day as well. And the horror story then? Oh, it would have to be it would have to be the six niller down at Hillsborough. Um, horrendous in in every single respect. Um, Leeds were just about to get caught in the limbo between GFH and Chilino as well. Um, poor old Matt Smith. I, I should have told this story, but when I spoke to him about it, he was saying it was the only game that his mum and dad ever left early because they just couldn't <laughs> cope with the abuse that was coming God. from from the away end. So they they slipped out quietly and um and made their made their excuses. But that was that was horrendous, and that really that felt so much like scraping the barrel. It was as if you you had it in your head that Leeds were one day going to get out of this, and one day it was going to they were going to find Bielsa, and it was going to be glorious. Um, or beautiful uh, but then there was always that little voice in your head which said this is just going to go on forever isn't it this is not this is never ever going to solve itself and that was one of those days that you drove home from thinking what you know what next speaking of Matt Smith actually I noticed this morning um, there was the, the Bradford goal against Leeds in the League Cup the, the game that Matt Smith scored in that was a a fairly horrific night as well. It was the night Hockaday was was well. He wasn't sacked on the night, I don't think, but it was the the day before, and the whole stadium singing, "You're getting sacked in the morning," and for a, just for a horrible vitriolic kind of atmosphere, both from the Bradford fans towards Leeds, Leeds fans more towards our own team and management. The whole thing was just absolutely awful. That toxic, was toxic. That was grim, and and Hockaday had had been well had been virtually sacked at least once already, um, by that point, which probably leads us quite nicely into another question that's coming. Interesting to see how you tackle this one then, Phil, from Sean. Um, <laughs> I mean, just how you're going to tiptoe through this one, I don't know. Hello, Phil and the boys. Which of the present squad would you say would be the most likely to break the international whaling ban? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> just to ensure no lawsuits or libel letters None through of the them. post, this is, this is purely a joke. And um, the, the answer is, of course, none at all. Um over the years, Janssen, maybe. <laughs> Why? I don't know. He the, just, the, he, the Swedes he just I mean, had I didn't a, eat Faroe Islands internationals. Cause... He just had a bit of a, a wild streak. But but then again, I, I, you does, know, it, does that equate to him going out on a gunboat? No, I don't think it does, does no. it? No. I'm going to no. say Liam Cooper, but it, it's by accident. I, I think I think Liam Cooper is the least likely to, um, to, to flout the international whaling ban and I could only see that happening if he mistakenly thought that a harpoon was a camera oh dear right on to something a little bit more serious and football related from Ian hi Phil uh, Ian here in Dublin um, I'm just wondering in January has there been any murmurings of incomings um, is there any chance that we will look to sign a striker um, which I believe we kind of need to push on um, just wondering what the situation is on that please thank you I better not talk about midfielders because we were getting into trouble on Twitter last week for um, talking about central midfielders, which, to be honest, might be a fair point. We are kind of labouring that um, a little bit or have done in previous weeks. I don't think they will do much or anything in January if the season is in hand. I think if they feel like it's under control and the league position is decent, um, then they'll let it go by like they, they have previously two reasons for that the first is that they don't see great value for money in January ever um, and also there is just this nagging doubt constantly about 
what sort of impact a January signing is going to make under Bielsa, given the, the history with Jean Kevin Augustine and, and the way in which you know, well, yeah, quite, um, <laughs> which, which is exactly what Leeds are, are trying to say as, as that case rumbles on. Uh, but yeah, I, I, whether, you know, the, the sort of introductory period under Bielsa of getting up to speed and everything else, they never really feel that it's a. It's a market in which they can get a massive advantage. But you're giving a politician's answer there, Phil, and I want to know what happens if we're 16th and two points off the drop. Well, I think that's when it when it potentially has to change, and and if they are in trouble or if it isn't going well, then they do need to they will need to seriously think about what they need to to get themselves through to the end of the season. They can't afford to take big risks by doing nothing in that window if if they feel like they need to. So that that would be the caveat to that. You what? I mean, my personal preference would be if the season is going pretty well at that stage would be to hold off in January and to gear up for something much bigger at the end of this season um, in the one position which shall not be named but which a player would be helpful I I would hope so Um, with that in mind then question here from Tony just wondering what your thoughts are on the season and where you realistically you think we're going to finish cheers Paul I mean what could possibly go wrong from you making a prediction oh dear Um, I, I think bottom half um, but I do think that there will be six, seven, potentially eight teams worse than Leeds this season. It's not going to be as good as last year, and I think we've been saying that from the start. But it's starting to come now. It's starting to develop. Um, I feel like the the best of the games against Newcastle, West Ham, Watford are far more like what we're we're used to seeing. So I think they they will be okay, and I still stand by them. My attitude, as it was in the summer, that a, a steady second season is no bad thing. Question now from Nathaniel. What do we think of Christopher Clarsen since joining Leeds? Is he able to step up if uh, Melier was to be injured as second choice goalkeeper, or are we? Do we think he's got that ability, or does he still need time? And we're just praying that Melier doesn't get injured. There is a good question there. What does happen if uh, Melier gets injured? Well, he's going to have to step up. I mean, there, there is. There's um, Van der Hoyville, obviously, but you know, no more experience than in Klassen, and and less so really because Klassen is coming on on the back of quite a few performances for Valerenga, quite a few games for them over in Norway. Um, the the scouting department th- thought a lot of Klassen. Uh, they were in touch about him a couple of years before they actually signed him, and as soon as Casilla went to to Elche, he was the goalkeeper they they went after, paid you know round about one and a half million pounds for him. Um, think of him as a really, really big prospect, um, much as they, they did about Melier when he came over from from Lorien. From what I've seen of him so far, he, he looks like a decent keeper. Whether he would be ready for the Premier League is really impossible to say. I mean, I, I, I have genuinely no idea, but I suspect that, that he would be okay as, a, as an understudy for Melier on the basis that he has had senior football over in Norway um, and, and there's clearly a lot to, to like about him but yeah I mean ideally Melier stays fit from start to finish Cameron's question now then Phil you've already told us how much you pay for a kebab what makes a pillow and a cushion different but what I want to know is would you rather go with out no Wi-Fi or have Alan Brazil and Misa away from you at all times let me know cheers bye the big questions answered on the Phil Hay show. Would you rather be without Wi-Fi? Uh, presumably that's a permanent thing. Or would you rather have Alan Brazil permanently one metre away from you? I do remember the kebab answer. I don't remember us debating cushions versus pillows, but no, we I could certainly either. do that next week if we're short of something for, for section two. Um, it depends on circumstances, and I don't want to, to give another politician's answer here, but if I'm inside Ellen Road... Um, given how awful the 4G is as soon as anybody gets near the ground, then I would have to have Alan Brazil within one metre of me at all times rather than forgo Wi-Fi because the afternoon would be a complete disaster. Um, But generally, despite how addicted I am to my phone and you get those awful weekly reports on your iPhone every Monday saying, this is how much time you've spent on your screen in the past week. (laughs) This is how bad a human you are. (laughs) Think, hide this from my wife, please. Um, And What's yours at at the minute? I can't remember the last one was, but it was something seriously embarrassing. Do you know what mine is? Go on. It's about eight and a half hours a day. Ma- <laughs> yeah, my, ma- phone, my phone doesn't have this, and I'm I'm fairly pleased. Yeah, screen time. Is, when you've got kids, you've nothing better to do, have you? They just you 
They're just there. You've got, you've got to be sort of you've got to be sort of watching them, haven't you, Jim? Yeah, that's so one one eye on the phone, one eye on the the fighting that's going on in the <laughs> in the corner. But um, mine is definitely in excess of eight hours. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah, that makes definitely. me feel a bit better. Uh, so, but I think football is run by phones, though, isn't it? The whole industry. Yeah, yeah. Know. No, it absolutely, absolutely. It seems to be run by WhatsApp more than anything. Um, so, but I could live without WhatsApp if. If I was going to have Alan Brazil on a one meter rope behind me for the rest of my life, <laughs> there's five G at Alan Road now. If you're on the right network, I've got that. Still doesn't work at half time, no, by the still, way. It's still on four G. Well, if it doesn't work, there's no point. It's not- <laughs> uh, God bless him. Back to Connor then. Different Connor this time with a question for you, Phil. Hi, Phil. I'm currently living in Nottingham, and my current barber in Nottingham used to cut the hair of Casper Sloth when he was at Notts County. And my barber told me, he knew that I was a Leeds fan, and he told me a story that Casper Sloth once told him that under Celino in one game at halftime, Celino came down to the dressing room and demanded three substitutions at halftime. I was wondering if he knew if this story is true or what game this story occurred in. Cheers. I mean, first, can we address Connor's use of Celino there? Celino, yes. Adjudication panel says no. Um, that's a claim to fame, isn't it? I used to cut Casper Sloss here in Nottingham. I wonder how many people he's, he's managed to, to say that to, and it, probably the first person who's gone, oh, I know he is. <laughs> when else they'd be like, nice one, mate. <laughs> um, I, I can't vouch for that story because I was never told that myself. Um, it falls into the list of things that could conceivably have happened during the Chilino era, definitely. Um, I mean, I, I've told the story of Chilino phoning it kind of midnight one o'clock in the morning to see how sick he was of hockey day after about three games did you, did you take um, that call obviously you must have done because yeah, you knew what he wanted yeah yeah no absolutely I, I didn't really know what to do with it i wasn't you know I wasn't, so talk, well, talk us through that where were you what were you doing at the time i was at home i got home it was after the brighton game midweek they lost two 0 sammy hippie was in charge of brighton at the time and leeds had been pretty meh really you know brighton had probably deserved to win that game and it was just a random phone call talking about how how tired he was of hockey day, even though hockey day had been there for like three games or or something like that. Which well, it was telegraphing the fact that hockey day was going to go pretty soon, but it was hard to know what to do with the phone call. He's, he's supposed to be writing about this. He's supposed to be keeping it to yourself. You never could tell with Chilino. And to be quite honest, virtually nothing with Chilino was off the record. He just said what would <laughs> you know what whatever was um was in his head. Uh, so. I know obviously there was that famous occasion as well where he went down to the kitchen um, to cook the tomato pasta um, before the game against Bournemouth, which leads one. And there was the great story of them walking in with the bowls of pasta and one of the players saying, where's my fucking chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want this. Um, so it might have happened. It, it might have happened. Who wanted um, chicken out of interest? Do you know? Um, I don't think I should say, but... Um, <laughs> I, I uh, Come on. I, I, it, could have, it could have happened... Um, but I can't say that it did. <laughs> I was trying to look through and see the game it could have been. There was a, a, a 2 0 defeat at Brighton later that season where Sloth himself was taken off uh, 59 minutes along with Mowat and uh, Morrison. They were both taken off shortly after half time. So right. I, wonder if, I wonder if maybe that was, was, that was the a, game. That was a fun night, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Lovely midweek drive home after that. Are, are you like me in that? I was saying this on our podcast um, earlier in the week. Uh, I, I refer to it all as like the before times now. Everything prior to 2018. Yeah. I think so. It feels, it feels a little bit like that. Um, some of it you can't believe went on, really. As I say, that there were spells where you felt like you were going to be trapped in it forever, and it was on over here. You had people saying, "Leeds are a huge club, and it'll be great when they get back to the Premier League, and the Premier League will be so much better when Leeds get get into the division." And then over here, you had all of us saying. Yeah, but it's just never going to happen, is it? You know, how how is it going to happen given the the circumstances? Which is why the last three years have been such a dream. Yeah. Okay. On to a question now then from Scott, and you can't give the same answer to the question you gave before. Okay. Who of all the managers that we've ever had while you've been uh, sort of reporting others have you disliked the most? So I'm not allowed to say Dennis Wise. I mean, you can, but we will start to pressure on other matters. Yeah. Um. I think Wise probably tops the list and I think the feeling was was very much mutual. I never got on very well with Warnock or at least not latterly not in the second half of the season where where he went um, I, I just couldn't see it really, I didn't see much in the way of I, it wasn't a squad that were going to get promoted but I think it was a squad that were playing below 
the level they should have been playing at and, and there was very little coming in the way of, of outstanding football most of those that I've got to know in, in any proper sense I've I've got on with to be honest yeah um, not been not been a huge not been a huge issue um, but yeah it would have to be wise why didn't he like you? well if you remember he came in in the middle of the season where they got relegated uh, from the championship um, and also then the summer of administration where, and I know people think that the Evening Post want critical enough of Bates, and to be quite honest, I'd agree, and that applies to me as well. Um, but we were very critical of Bates through that summer and, and also through the back end of the, the season where the, where the club went down. Um, we were we were banned twice. And Wise, I think, took that pretty personally. And we took the criticism of himself very personally, which I understand, but also the criticism of Bates because in that period, him and Bates were, were very, very close. Um, and it's probably fair to say that he just didn't like the media very much um, at all. I mean, he went to Newcastle and from what I've been told up there, he, he was a director up there, I think director of football, did absolutely nothing with the press ever, never spoke to them once. They didn't know what he was doing really or, or what his, his remit was. I think he was just happier out of that bubble. Other than Bates, who did Wise like? Because he seems to be one of those people who everywhere he's gone, he's had fairly significant fallings out with people. Well... I will say, I mean, you know, Bates was pretty unhappy when he, he left and, and, you know, hot-footed it up to, to Newcastle, although I understood at the time that it made a lot more sense for Wise's personal situation. His, his family was still down in London and, and hadn't moved up to Leeds and he was seeing very, very little of them at the time. So the move to Newcastle made perfect uh, sense. Yeah, well, well, he was working out of an office in London, he wasn't was, he? was, you see. So he was able to fly in and out of, of Newcastle and it was kind of, you know, it was less of a requirement to be there um, all hours. He 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 loved Poye, obviously. Um, although he was frustrated by by Poye going down to Spurs when he did. In actual fact, you'll find plenty of players who liked him. Um, Beckford being one of them. Beckford always said that you know, Wise was the manager who said to him, "I I honestly believe in you, and I think you I think you can be very good for us." And before the season, the the oh seven oh eight season, the minus fifteen year, he said to Beckford, "Look." I'm going to play you in Candle and I'm going to get criticised for it and people are going to moan because I can tell that people don't rate you and don't like you, supporters. But I don't give a fuck because I'm the manager and I'll do what I like. And mm. that was wise. And and in those circumstances, it, it worked really well. And, and there were players who came in in that minus 15 moment, which was obviously a real mess. And, and you know, at a time where a lot of players would not have wanted to sign for the club. And he was he he was good to them. They they did enjoy working with him. Um, I've spoken to plenty of players, plenty of players who didn't like him, but I've spoken to plenty who did like him as well. Presumably, well, Beckford didn't have the the balls to say no, Dennis. I think people don't like and don't rate you, <laughs> <laughs> which is but, the actual truth. But of course, what happened that season was that suddenly it all clicked, and they had that long, long run, unbeaten run, that long winning run to start with. They shot right up the league. And put themselves bang in contention for for a playoff place, and it was it was actually quite an amazing period that, especially after the the utter misery of the relegation season and the fact that they'd been deducted fifteen points, and you assumed that that season was just a complete write off. You know, there was very little chance of them of them getting it together. Um, it was a it was a pretty pretty fascinating period. What about Bates? What was what was he like to deal with? Did you have a decent relationship with him, or was it spiky? I was spiky. No, it was always always spiky. Um, Difficult to deal with, mainly because Bates never thought he was wrong. You know, when when he when he took a view on something, that was his view, and and he would stick to it. And even if you tried to argue him round, or even if you tried to argue the toss over things that you'd you'd written, if he wasn't having it, he just wasn't having it. Um, and that was the same thing. You know, every now and again, you'd get calls on the the Evening Post sports desk saying uh, from his secretary saying, the "Chairman wants to speak to you." And you're thinking, oh, go good, oh joy, <laughs> here we go. Um, so no, it was it was pretty fractious. Yeah. Did you uh, did you get any letters from Carter Rock? No, although who are a firm the, of solicitors, I should uh, say. The Evening Post did at one stage. I, I do remember that, but no, not me personally. Right, and we'll finish on a football one. Oh, why we've, not? We've dealt with whaling. Now let's do this on football from Jack. Phil, with a few of our centre backs coming back from injury, and considering a few of our newest signings were signed for their versatility, what are your thoughts on pushing Calvin into an eight position like he sometimes does for England, and moving Strauch or Robin uh, when he's back into the CDM position to kind of support our current midfield problems? Thanks, guys. Cheers. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, that bo- borderline on, on a par with. 
putting Melier up front. I mean, not really because Phillips ha- was actually really good in that position for England, but um, he he has to he has to be there for Leeds. You, you've got to have him in that position. There is still nobody, I think, in the squad at Leeds who is even close to touching what he does um, in that that number four role. So no, keep him there. Sign somebody else. Jobs are good. Um, and just to reiterate, I don't actually think Jansen would have flouted the national <laughs> whaling ban. He's is 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 a good guy, is, is Pontus. Um, whatever you know, whatever's been said about however many harpoons he owns, what, whatever's been said about him, um, deep down, good guy who's doing extremely well at Brentford. Uh, just regards to um, not the whaling ban, Phillips. He's been likened with his like sort of rangy long passing to a quarterback. I think he's as important to Leeds United as a quarterback is to an NFL team. Well, you you'll have read quite often over the years, you know that phrase being used, Phillips quarterback in the team, and and it is like that. It's it's like he, you know, the ball comes to him, and he starts to pick the difficult passes going going forward. I mean, the centre backs in Bielsa's team do a bit of that as well. And we were talking about Yorente, you know, his his long range distribution, how good it is, and Cooper you know, very often looks for diagonals to the wing, left to right, um, to, to open things up. But that's how it is with Phillips. It is kind of like total control in that area, Tom Tom Brady style. I don't know if that's a good good comparison. I mean I know nothing about NFL, so let's let's not get too I think uh, Tom Brady is a good he's a good NFL or is Tom Brady, I think. I think a good NFL. Yeah, that's what they call him. Slightly, isn't it? slightly um, gridironing. It's good at gr- yeah, the gridironing, isn't yeah. it? Sli- slightly underestimating him. Um, but yeah, that's that's the thing. It's you need in this system where you have one midfielder sitting between defensive line, of, uh, midfield line of four, and defensive line of four, you need total control there, and that is what Phillips brings. So, in terms of moving him to eight, no, don't do it, kids. Well, given the chats about whaling and so on, should we do this again in the next international break? Yes, why not? Why not? It's been fun. <laughs> 